We're here today with Diana Graski from the National Center for State Courts uh, to talk a bit about uh, the use of artificial intelligence by judiciaries. So, Diana, would you please briefly describe the work of the National Center for State Courts and CSC on the matter of the use of artificial intelligence by judiciaries? Sure, sure. Um, you can call me Di, and uh, I work with the National Center for State Courts. This is a nonprofit organization uh, in the United States that works with our state and local courts all across the country, but we also work with courts across the world, our international division. So uh, that uh, in the technology division, we are very interested in working with courts to um, see how they can um, implement technology to improve um, their public service, uh, to improve public access, to improve uh, public trust and confidence, uh, and judicial efficiency. Um, and that's, uh, that's one of the ways in which we are keeping track of the use of artificial intelligence in the U.S. courts. Um, another way that uh, we are doing it is by actually leading some kinds of research efforts. Um, so, for instance, with funding from the State Justice Institute, uh, the National Center for State Courts Technology Division has been able to perform a few proofs of concepts uh, of artificial intelligence, legal, legal analytics, um, and measure the accuracy of those um, AI tools in their analysis of um, court filings. So those are the two ways. We're directly working with courts, but also leading some efforts to try to understand emerging technologies. That's very interesting. Uh, from our uh, experience in the Global Judicial Integrity Network, uh, some member states are introducing predictive AI systems for case management. So could you explain to the average judge how these systems work? Sure, Roberta. And I hope that you'll um, let me know if this is what you mean when you say predictive AI. Um, for the National Center for State Courts, we're very interested in understanding in the near future whether legal analytics might be able to look at incoming civil filings and analyze the content of the initial pleadings, the, the complaint from the plaintiff and the answer from the defendant, and predict the level of complexity of that civil case. And the purpose of trying to understand the likely complexity of that new case is that we could then route the case into the appropriate case management track. In other words, we're trying to perform triage on new civil filings so that they receive the proper amount of case management from the judge, the proper amount of discovery, the proper timelines uh, for uh, moving the case toward resolution. Um, and, and so that, that tracking uh, system or triage system is something that we believe artificial intelligence might be able to do. Is that the kind of predictive AI that you're thinking about too? Uh, yes, for case management that would be, but that brings the question of predictive AI applied to the decisions. Uh, of the judges. Uh, could you say a bit about the potential risks for using AI to predict decisions? Sure, sure. So completely different, in, in my mind at least, it's a completely different matter when you're looking at legal analytics, the machine, actually providing a potential substantive answer to a legal or factual question. So, um, People get very uncomfortable, um, but but I think that there are some um, very typical predictive AI tools currently being used by the courts in the United States. These are primarily take the form of risk assessment tools in criminal cases, and you know risk assessment tools have been used by um, state and local courts for a long, long time. In fact, they were. They've really been um, promoted 
uh, as a way of reducing uh, pretrial detention of criminal defendants. And to a large extent, um, the courts have been successful in finding alternatives to pretrial detention, and, and we believe that that's very, very good for a society. Um, but you're, there's no doubt, you're right, there are risks. Fundamentally, the risks uh, involve the, the machine, the artificial intelligence, building algorithms that are based on training sets of data that are historical uh, cases, case data. So to the extent that our historical judicial decisions reflect societal biases, whether that's racial bias or income bias or gender bias or who knows what other kinds of social biases there might be cropping up in our American historical data, those will likely be reflected by the computers, right, by the um, artificial intelligence in their uh, pr predictions of, of uh, risk assessments. So, you know, we need to think very carefully about that and, and definitely be mindful of efforts that we can all take to mitigate uh, the risks of that bias creeping into some of those risk assessment tools. Mm -hmm. And uh, and going back to the more broad issues, mm. uh, what areas does artificial intelligence uh, typically address and what are the benefits they bring? We just talked about risks, so maybe we can uh, also talk about benefits. Sure, sure. Um, one, um, one way that we definitely see uh, legal analytics helping uh, the courts achieve greater transparency and public access to court case records um, so, for instance, um, there are um, several courts in the United States now that are applying legal analytics to brand new filings coming into the court in order to uh, find and block um, personally identifiable information. So there's a great interest among American judges and clerks to improve um, public access to court case records as a way of uh, achieving public trust and confidence in what the work that the courts do. But at the same time, we don't want to expose any party or witness or jurors or police officers uh, personally identifiable information on the internet. So there have been a couple of different approaches taken in the past, none of which were really very good. And what we believe is that by running these legal analytics, uh, looking for PII in new court case filings, everyone can have more confidence that we are maximizing public access while also maximizing the protection of parties' personal information. So that's one, one possible application. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's certainly very interesting. And uh, NCSC uh, works with state courts in the U.S., but also works with uh, judiciaries from different parts of the world. And uh, from that perspective, do you see a shift towards uh, AI for case management internationally? I do. And um, I think that in large measure, this will be driven by the private sector. Um, you know, <laughs> courts are always a little slow when it comes to adopting new technology. That's just the nature. We're very, you know, across the globe, we're very conservative organizations in terms of being careful and cautious of adopting new technologies. The private sector, on the other hand, is gung ho, um, and they are able to take m more risks. So. Um, what, what I would see uh, expanding around the globe very rapidly are the kinds of anal um, artificial intelligence tools that primarily serve lawyers. So this is the idea that there are commercially viable products out there now that are um, promising lawyers that they can help um, them put together the perfect winning litigation team for that individual case assigned to that individual judge. There are other products that are helping lawyers shop judges across venues uh, based on the facts of their case. Um, there are um, 
artificial intelligence tools now out in the market that are um, assisting with uh, deep, deep analysis of massive amounts of data um, for e-discovery purposes, but, but also others. And so I think that it's important for the courts to be aware that that is going on um, with the people who come before them, the, the lawyers who come before them. Um, judges probably need to be aware that their performance, their prior opinions is absolutely being analyzed by computers now and that is being packaged into a product that's being sold to lawyers now. Uh, so yeah, there will definitely be a shift uh, internationally toward artificial intelligence for case management from an attorney's perspective. That, that is already happening, yeah. And for the judiciaries, would you recommend such a shift moving forward? Yes, I think that's right. Um, one of the things that we see in more and more cases is just, like, like we see in every aspect of our lives, there's just so much more data now. So I imagine that the volume of evidence, especially digital evidence, that is gonna be um, presented in individual cases, that volume is just gonna go up and up and up. So at what point is it no longer humanly possible for a judge to review you know, every exhibit, every piece of evidence, every, um, there may need to become a time when judges have got some assistance in um, highlighting the most relevant bits of data in these giant collections of information. Um, one example that's <clears throat> that we're really looking at hard in the United States right now is in the area of guardianships and conservatorships. So in this area, um, the courts are responsible for providing oversight of those court-appointed fiduciaries who are charged with protecting um, people who are incapacitated either through extreme A, old age, or um, disease or injury. Um, and you know, to our shame, the, the United States courts are, are not doing a very good job of providing a rigorous judicial oversight of, of those uh, guardians and conservators. Maybe legal analytical tools could be brought to bear to sift through these mountains and mountains and mountains of uh, data and financial filings and be able to highlight for judges and for their staff those cases that most likely need additional attention or intervention by, by the court. Um, that's one possible way in which um, those could, AI could be a real tool to help judges manage caseloads that are just overwhelming right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's certainly a challenge uh, for all of the judiciaries all over the world. And it's only going to get worse. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we need all the tools we can get. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Dai. Thank uh, you, Roberta. This was very uh, interesting. Uh, and to everyone listening, this was uh, an episode of the Global Judicial Integrity Network podcast series on the use of artificial intelligence by judiciaries. Uh, this topic is also uh, going to be uh, part of the activities of the network in 2019 for the development of guidelines on how to create court and case management systems that are in line with the Bangalore principles of judicial conduct. So stay tuned for other episodes and also for more information about the work uh, of the Global Judicial Integrity Network in this topic. Thank you.